Welcome to Steam Powered, where I have conversations with women in Steam to learn a little bit about what they do and who they are. I'm your host, Michelle Ong. My guest today is Professor Janine Ilian. Janine is Chair in Statistical Sciences at the University of Glasgow and author of Statistical Analysis and Modeling of Spatial Point Patterns, the current standard work on point process modeling. Her spatial modeling research has been applied to fields such as ecological biodiversity, crime and terrorism modeling, and earthquake forecasting. Join us as we talk about spatial point modeling and its applications in areas of ecology, orangutan populations, and COVID. Thank you, Janine, for joining me today. I really appreciate you taking the time to speak to me about yourself and your work. Thank you. <laughs> so you're a professor and a researcher in the area of statistical science, but what led you to the field of mathematics to begin with? Oh, it's, a, it's a bit of a, a long story. I, I always liked math at school, but somehow didn't really think it's something I want to do as a career. I, you know, because at school, you, 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 know, you don't really see the relevance of math um, very much. So I just thought, okay, I can do it, but there are also other things. So I started uh, studying psychology initially and realized that I had to do a lot of statistics and that I actually enjoyed doing this. Um, and that was back in Germany. So I did my first degrees in, in Germany. And um, as the, at the time you couldn't really, at least my, my university, you couldn't study statistics. You had to study mathematics. So I, got, I decided, okay, in addition to psychology, I will also do math. So I did two degrees at the same time. Wow. Studying in Germany, <laughs> it was free, so you didn't have to pay. You could just do, do, do things at the same time. And then I realized that really it was statistics that interested me most. Um, but I didn't really want to pursue statistics in ecology that, uh, sorry, in psychology that much, because it was all kind of experimental design and experiments and uh, analysis of experiments, which is interesting, but not as exciting as I, I kind of found the area of ecology that I now work, work in um, mainly um, because it's, it was more kind of formulated and you you go learn how to do things properly and that was it. I couldn't really see how you could do exciting research in there. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, and I, I ended up um specializing in, in statistics, um mainly spatial statistics with applications in ecology. Oh wow. So how did you come to find that you had an interest in the ecological side of um statistics? I think <laughs> that's that's actually quite um Interesting. So, you know, I had, I had finished my degrees, um, which are kind of master's like degrees, both in math, um, math and English, actually, and, uh, and psychology. Um, and was, I was looking for a PhD position, um, potentially abroad. And so I looked around. And there, there was this offer for doing a PhD part time while lecturing um, at the university in Scotland. And I had studied in Scotland before for a year just as a visiting student. And I kind of thought, oh, that's interesting. And um, they didn't really, because there was a sort of part-time degree, there, there wasn't actually a, a specific topic attached to it, um, or like a, a prescribed project, PhD project, um, but just a potential supervisor. And then I got you know in touch with the, this person and talked to them, and they, they worked in ecology, and I kind of thought, yeah, that's probably it. And um, yeah, so we we decided to move to Scotland, and um, it oh, all wow. started from there. And yeah, and it got I got deeper into the, into the ecology as I as I went along, basically. Um, but and I'm now working on on you know other subjects as well. It's not just ecology, um, but it's still the main um, area of application where I you know that I work on statistical ecology or applications of statistics in ecology um, rather than statistical ecology itself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, what sort of applications does um, the statistical modeling have in ecology? It's oh, it's a, it's a large number of things. It's and a, a lot of times in in ecology, you want to you're interested in conservation of of um, animals, plants, and so on. So you, you want to understand um, how they, you know, thrive. So, you know, what are the areas that the habitats um, that they prefer? Where do they like to be? What are the properties of these habitats? Um, so a lot of my work is spatial statistics. So we are trying to figure out why do you find lots of these plants or these animals in a specific environment? And what is the environment, environment like? So you characterize the environment. So you, do you, you model the spatial structure? Um, based on um, the properties of the environment in space and time. And that's, that's the idea. And you can do this with animals, um, but also with, with plants. Animals are a bit more difficult because they can you know, move around. <laughs> <this year. laughs> and so we, we do a lot of work with marine animals, for example. And of course, they can also be underwater. Um, 
and then you can't see them. You have issues with not detecting them and you have to take into account that they might be there, but you're just not seeing them and, and things like that. So it's fairly complex um, in terms of modeling. A lot of this requires um, very computationally intensive methodology as well. That's um, one of my interests. You can develop methods that are computationally realistic and efficient. So you can write down super complicated models, but you can't then in the end fit them because computation would take years. Um, and then, of course, that's useful if you want to advise a, a con conservationist um, and you have to get back to them and say, well, I can tell you this in five years' time. But it's probably not <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, um, you know, we want to have things that are practical and, and relevant in practice um, and provide answers to, to concrete questions. Oh, that's great. So it's not just um, looking at past data, you're also able to do projections with the modeling as well? And that's what you're using to advise? Yeah, uh, that's, that's, that's one of the applications. So you work, but sometimes you really just want to know where do the, do the animals they like to be. Sometimes you want to know how many there are and you can't really kind of observe the whole ocean. Obviously, you only have subsets and you want to be able to interpolate it outside into you know the whole ocean say or the whole lake or forest or whatever um but also in, into the future if you want to so we've been involved in one project where we looked at where we're looking at cranes in the uk they um they they were absent from the uk until the 1970s at some point when you know one breeding pair appeared in in the uk and then they, there was a reintroduction introduction scheme but it's still a very kind of small population. So there are only in some areas in, in, in England. And, but people want to predict where they might go next. Um, and it's very complicated to figure this out because, you know, you know, they might, they like wetlands, but they are wetlands all over the UK. But they're not going to take that is the furthest away from where they currently are. So it's not just the properties of the wetlands, but also the, the distance from their current location and the, the, the structure and the accessibility of these these wetlands so you take have to take all this into account and they're trying to make predictions into the future how this population will develop um it can also be kind of looked at in the context of um you know the, the climate changing and um thing you know, animals moving north because it's colder there um where would they go they are not just like you know linearly going north they're going to kind of areas that are relevant to them and accessible and so that modeling can be used for that as well to predict that behavior Wow. So just even just from what you've just been telling me, like the amount of data that you would need to work with sounds phenomenally huge because, you know, the climate patterns, the migration patterns, like even the properties, as you said. So I assume you'd be working with the ecologists on this. Do you have to do any field work as well for getting this kind of data or is it mainly um, remote? Um, so I, I, I've never really done any field work. I've, I've, I've only kind of sometimes joined ecologists like just so that's out of interest but um, I've never really done this but the ecologists that you know I've worked always work um, very strongly with them it's um that's one of my kind of important things that you can't really do applied modeling without really kind of engaging with the other fields you can't just say like give me your data I'll <laughs> put it in. you need to really understand because the, you know but from, there's some I'm not I, I don't I won't ever really understand all the ecologists but ec ecology the ecologists will, of course, never really understand the statistics because that's our. But we need to kind of, you know, get together somewhere in between. Um, and so I think, as an applied statistician, it's it's really or applied modeler. I guess it's the same for mathematical modelers. It's it's really important to have a, a fairly good understanding of of the issues and to interact very strongly with the, with the ecologists um, in terms of communication and not just saying, well, you know, to give me the data, do something with it, because that's not leading to a proper answer, produce something, but something relevant. So it's an ongoing dialogue. And that's what I really enjoy, actually, the, the communication. And also the, I constantly learn new things. Um, and they're not, of course, I also learn new statistical things because, you know, I love new methods. But um, also new eco ecological issues, which are really exciting. I, I find this very, very, very interesting. And I think that's kind of, in hindsight, getting back to the earlier question, how I got into ecology. I think there's like something in me that has always had this interest. Um, you know, that yeah, I think I, even as a child, but I didn't really know that I'm interested in ecology because I didn't know ec ecology exists as a, <laughs> as a field. But I've always kind of wondered why is this like this? You know, um, but. In, I think bio, biology, you know, when I went to school, biology was not really ecology. You had to kind of describe what a leaf looks like and you know, all these things. That was interesting, but again, not something where I thought I, I want to be a biologist. But now I like this kind of 
in between and learning about the ecology is as exciting. So um, with the, uh, because you have to learn about the ecological sciences, like, um, was it purely through communication? Did you have to teach yourself or, you know, how, how did you learn to pick up all this extra stuff that you needed to know to be able to help inform the statistical side? I think it's, I mean, a lot of it is really dialogue with people that interest. Um, we, we then sometimes go to eco- ecology conferences as well and listen to talks there. Um, of course, sometimes I just read about it as well because I find it interesting. And the a start of my, or during my PhD, I actually did some kind of explicit textbook reading of ecology textbooks. And I never had, you know, of, of course, exams in it, but I, kind of, I was worried for my viva that I, I would, you know, somebody would really ask me details of, of it, <laughs> even run out of words, because of course, even the terminology, it wasn't that familiar to me. And, um, but of course it didn't happen. <laughs> Sometimes really I'm reading about it, but I never had any, any formal teaching beyond what we did at school. Um, and some of that. But sometimes I think that's actually a, a beneficial because I, I didn't kind of come up in ecology. So sometimes, of course, my naive questions, which can be very naive, and people kind of well, sometimes then say, you should know this or something. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I think it's like it's a fresh mind. You know, you hit hit um, the community with a question that they might not have thought about because the, the tradition is different. Yeah, so they've come up with these fixed ideas about how you'd be learning all this information, but you're not coming from the same background. So your perspective and the way you approach the concept will be slightly different. And some and I, that has, has sometimes been reflected in, in in the research actually. So the, you know that we were looking at um, the, you know some output from ecological models and wanted to kind of assess which model is actually the more real, realistic one. Um, and I, at some point I said, yeah, but why don't you look at the spatial pattern of this? And I never really thought about it. But you know I think about spatial structures all the time, so that for me that was the ob- obvious thing to look at. <laughs> and it, yeah. She very useful for for the comparison of model results. I don't want to go into detail there because it's very theoretical. Um, but um, you know it can be quite refreshing, I think, for for the other community or um, research community to, to actually ask the slightly naive questions that come with being a non-expert. Because they will already have had other ideas about how they want to think about that concept. So yeah, it's a, it's a good way to get them to reframe some of the concepts. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> And um, so you mentioned before when we were talking online that uh, you'd ended up traveling to Perth, Australia as part of your PhD, or at least in part for your PhD. So how how do you end up traveling to another well, another country for research data? That that seems like a very cool way of getting travel. Yeah, well, that's I mean, it was actually different um, in in the sense that the, the, the data already existed. Um, I, I was looking at modeling plants in Australia. That was my, my PhD topic um, at the time. And because the, 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 the fauna and flora in, in Australia is so different from the rest of the world, it was quite useful to actually see it. Um, I never really saw the, the actual data set or the actual location because it had been mined, so the plant didn't oh. exist anymore. But, um, so my, my um, PhD supervisor had contacts to, to people at Kings Park in, um, in, in Perth in Australia. And, um, at some point, we you know got funding to actually travel across, and I was able to you know visit similar sites and saw the plants, and because they have a, a very specific way of of um, surviving fires and and so on, it was very interesting to actually see this because that was relevant for the modeling I, I undertook. Um, I mean, it, it, it wasn't essential, but um, it was a very good argument to make to funders, <laughs> um, yes. and it was very helpful for me to to really appreciate how different. Um, the flora there is it's not just that the, the flowers look different that's you know the case everywhere you travel <laughs> obviously they're slightly different because in australia is, is um is extreme it was just this very very dry um soil and very nutrient poor soil where the where the plants survive five fires in, in different ways which you know you, you don't find in europe and we i wasn't familiar with at all and um the high biodiversity that you find there which um is quite quite exciting so that's very cool. Yeah, um, I, one of my previous guests, uh, Dr. Lucy Commander, she actually works in uh, seed restoration and has worked on mine sites to help restore the ecology in that area as well. So we've been we spoke to her briefly about um, the fire recovery and mining recovery for those areas. It's pretty cool. 
I've um, not really worked on this specifically very much. I've more kind of moved on to modeling um, in, in terms of kind of bot botanic uh, research. I've, I've moved on to a more modeling rainforests, but it's, for me, it's, it's been the kind of top topic of um, biodiversity um, and modern biodiversity, understanding biodiversity patterns and so on, that's been, become more relevant. But that started with a fairly biodiverse data set from both. Yeah, that is very cool. Um, so yeah, you mentioned also that um, you've got research on a broad variety of topics and not just ecology. Like I, I was looking at your uh, publication history and you've, you know, covered things like cancer and terrorism. How do those, uh, how are you approach or how do you discover those topics of research? Because it's just, they're just so varied. Yeah, that's, I mean, a lot of the time this is really pure luck in a way that you, met, <laughs> that you come across a person who is interested in that topic and you start talking to them and then it, it turns out that oh it's all spatial it's a um it's kind of relevant to me and whether whether terrorism model, modeling I actually had a PhD student well it was that th there was a PhD student who was not my PhD student back I I worked in St Andrews at St Andrews University before um joining Glasgow where I'm now um and he basically came to my office um as a PhD student in St Andrews. In international relations, wanting to look at model, you know, spatial um, structures in terrorist attacks, and he came to see me because um, he had, you know, found my CV online and realized I'm in St Andrews, so I could he could just come, come and speak to me, and I said, well, you know, my data, that's what I'd like to do, and um, so we started collaborating, and his PhD topic shifted more and more towards the statistics, so that I eventually I became his main supervisor. Um, because you know, the focus of his PhD changed so much. Um, and yeah, well, he's now um, has his PhD and we still collaborate. Um, and, oh, that's um, brilliant. So that's, that's, that's just happened. And cancer research was basically through a um, former colleague of mine who has worked on cancer and knew of my um, spatial modeling um, background. And yeah, I've, I've worked on, on earthquakes as well, where I met somebody through a Scotland White um, researchers um, scheme. So, you know, it's, it, this happens that you meet somebody in a, a interdisciplinary seminars or you happen to talk to them. Um, it's, it's, yeah, pure luck in a, in a sense or coincidence, you must think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> An open mind. And I, I did wonder whether... Um like your collaborators were statisticians as well, or whether they were in completely other fields, but clearly they're, you know, they're looking in other areas and yeah, they're just collaborating with someone who can help support their work in that statistical area that, yeah, the multi-disc for that is just amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, so yeah, they're mostly, and it's, it's rare that I actually, I mean, of course I have statistical coll collaborators as well. Um, some of the, when we develop statistical methodology, you nowadays you often need a team of statisticians on as as well because you know it's it's all about um, the computational side of things it's the theoretical side of things um, the implementation side of things and the communication with the with the applied field so it, it usually is like you know, a team on both sides in in a, in a way um, so it's it's not that you know I'm the sole statistician or um, working with only with um, applied people or you know other researchers um, I'm also kind of part of a, you know a, I don't know a, a group, or I, I don't want to call it a group, but like you know, a, a range of um, statisticians that I work with on specific. There are a lot of there are there are a lot of contributors in those areas. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, exactly. What are you? Oh, is there anything particularly you're researching at the moment? Yeah, I mean, um, the recently we have have done quite a lot of um, work actually in, in the context of of COVID modeling. Um, uh, I did wonder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's of course also spatial. Um, I I don't want to really say I, I've I've been the person doing the modeling because that's that's actually not true. I think I've I've um in that context mainly been that kind of the the in between person because that's often been my my role. Like you know I'm I'm obviously like communicating between um areas of research a, a lot, and um so the. When the when the pandemic happened, of course, everywhere research were thinking, researchers were thinking, what can I do? What, how can I help? Um, and in Glasgow, a fairly big um, consortium actually formed very quickly, um, partly funded um, from from um, Royal Society funding, or not really funded, supported. Let's say we didn't really get direct funding. 
Um, and I was involved in this um, because people were running models there and they needed mathematical and statistical input. And um, I was kind of forming the bridge between the mathematicians and the statisticians and that group. Um, but it, it's a kind of huge group of, I think, up to about 200 people being involved in, in, a, in a whole kind of pipeline of, of modeling where, you know, starting from the data input into the actual um, pa parameterization of the models, the running of the models, tidying up the, the computational side of things of those models and then visualizing the, the results in an understandable way. And within four months, the, this whole kind of thing um, developed. Um, and, you know, I, I was part of that, but I wouldn't say it's, it's my thing. There are other people who have come to uh, claim more, no, I claim that they've been leading this much more than, than I have. I've just been part of it. But that's been an interesting experience because it's very different from the research we usually uh, is done. You know, you usually have your own projects and then you compete with others for the funding and so on. And here everybody's saying, OK, I want to contribute. What can I do? Um, and within four months, so much more happens than would normally happen in, in like, you know, 10 times uh, that time um, because people just came together. And there was no competition because it doesn't, you know, competition doesn't make sense uh, in that context. So just formed this this consortium and contributed their time um, as much as they could, um, and that was a, a very very interesting experience um, to have as a kind of. I can imagine that's incredible, and to and that's um, just global, or is that localized to the UK? Um, it was local um so in initially it really started in glasgow but um by now there are people from um outside glasgow and in, involved at, oh they became kind of really from the start um it was more of a scottish thing but not, not really limited to scotland in, in any kind of strict sense it's that of course initially you know people who are close to you and those are the first people yeah it just kind of grows as you start to go oh i know someone who might and then it goes on from there yeah, and because it had to happen quickly, that's just how it happens when it happens quickly. But it's it's an um it's an UK thing, and um in in general because of course, but but the, the modeling wasn't really really limited to this. There there, there was some kind of spatial modeling involved, to, which then really looked at Scotland or the UK in terms of where um things would happen. Um, because you can't really do that globally for computational reasons. That would just be yes. too big. Um. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, uh, you can t can do this in theory if you have if you're not suddenly su uh, surprised that there's a pandemic. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think we could have set it up so that we could do it, but we hadn't, of course. Um, and but the the other things like the the, the, the a model parameters, for example, um, came from studies in China, in Ireland, in different countries, um, because obviously not all the different um, parameters and problems or yeah, knowledge about the virus only came from the UK. That, of course, knowledge is so limited um, that we took all the information that was available somewhere um, to feed into the model, if models if possible, and um, and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was just curious about whether, um, if each region was doing separate models, whether there was any interesting uh, points of note about the differences between the models uh, based on the region that they were might be modeled in. Um, I think it, it probably it probably would, but that would probably um, pick up things that are different, difficult to put explicitly into the models. Um, you know, kind of cultural things. Um, you know, how people interact. Um, the behavioural, the social, the way those social interactions are different between each area and the cultural. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I could imagine that. You know, like somewhere in northern Europe and somewhere in southern Europe. You know, some of the interaction would be more or less physical or you know that, like, I, and that's pretty difficult to put into an explicit model because you're obviously not really modeling every kind of arm movement of an individual or something. <laughs> you know, yeah the city thing you know you can't really put this tiny, tiny detail in, into a, um into into the model and, and of course kind of local policies and things like that are also you know some of them you could probably of course if you know you, you can if you limit movement or not something like very obvious kind of in a, in a model, but there might be kind of tiny things that are difficult to catch, capture, and these will come up as differences, um, in, you know, in, in different areas potentially. Yeah, and that's probably a, a study that would look, would be done in you know in the future when we have more data, um, and then you could look at really like comparisons in you know, in different countries in Europe or globally, or you know, just within a bigger country, 
in different areas within that country and, 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 and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's very interesting. Just from a sociological perspective, I'm actually now curious about it. <laughs> yeah. Segue. Um, I don't know if you'd heard about, okay, World of Warcraft. Um, they had an issue with a pandemic a few years ago and they actually had a bunch of, um, they did a lot of statistical modeling on it to determine how it was spread and it was spread between the servers. Um, and they were, you know, talking about the sociological, um, factors around it, the way that it was spread, the way that, um, it just different factors about how it spread as a pandemic across the service is digital virus. And apparently all of that modeling was also requested by the CDC for their modeling for pandemics. And yeah, <laughs> it all kind of led to this sort of stuff. Yeah. And, and then of course with, with human beings, um, the, the connectedness is probably less, less known. Um, you know, it, you know, you see, you need to, you need to kind of take into account how connected, two locations are you know exactly you have two locations very close to each other in kind of geographical space but there is a jungle around them or something getting from one place to the next takes forever and that would also happen you know with a virus because it, it would mean people would have to kind of shake hands or something but exactly. they probably will never eat and if they're sitting is isolated somewhere in the middle of a, of a jungle um in, in the extreme it will just disappear but if it's very well connected in a very busy city that's a completely different thing. But then in the, in the big city, kind of modeling or explicitly modeling the connectedness is difficult because there's so many channels. It's kind of the roads, it's the air, you know, where people can walk or and, and all, all, all these. Surfaces and, you know, ventilation and, yeah, all this all these other infrastructure things that will actually get in the way of being able to clearly see how all of this works. That's it. As there's often um, a, a question also in the, in the ecological um, modeling um, when you when you look at that's why why I came up with the idea of the, or thinking of a jungle as an example. Yeah. In you know if you if you're interested in studying animal um, animals in space, it depends on on the connectedness and also how and how easily the animal, animals can move through a certain habitat. Um, you know if, if it is a jungle, it's difficult. Yeah. But if it's a, open savanna they can just run through it potentially if they can run um and that makes makes a difference and will would be implemented in in models as well and that's actually quite difficult because you know how do you quantify how easy it is to move through a landscape um, you know is, is it three times as difficult or that's that's something that isn't that isn't um, entirely clear um how to do very interesting problems to solve Yes, you know, one that, that just reminds me of that. Well, that one, well, sorry, I'm just, just uh, digress. But one of the an inter, uh, of the interesting projects I'm currently involved in is, is looking at um, orangutans yeah. in, uh, in Malaysia, um, where there's a trying to understand um, yeah, their habitat, as I was saying earlier. Um, it, they're interested in, in where the orangutans like to be. There are not that many of them left, and, and the um, the forest is, 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 you know, just bitty. It has become bitty and difficult and um, degraded um, and so on. And they, um, there is an understanding. So the government, um, the Malaysian government, wants to um, help, you know, kind of help restore, um, or yes, conserve the, the orangutans. And um, the study um, PhD student, not of mine, of, of a colleague of mine, but I'm involved in, in their work, um, is working on is uh, looking at um, modeling the nest. Of orangutans, they they form nests. I mean, not, not obviously not in the trees like like birds. They you know it's their kind of thing where they they spend a few days and nights. Um, and you can see them um, from from the air. They are actually using um, drones to collect the data because it's oh, wow. very difficult to walk through a jungle. Obviously, and they got the uh, the um, you know, um, habitats there, and um, they collect that, that, that data and um, try to understand or, you know where you find more nests which also would mean where, where there are more orangutans. It's difficult to, to directly see them, um, but you can see them, but you would have to kind of randomly walk through the forest constantly, and that's difficult to do. So it's easier with the drones. But it's that, that comes with a problem that you need to be able to actually see the nests from footage you have. Um, so there's a lot of work on into actually seeing, um, you know, having uh, using citizen science methods 
where um, they show photos of um, the area and people are, are asked to kind of identify where they find find nests in the in the pictures. And that's actually very, very difficult to do. Well, the whole point is that they're trying to be camouflaged to be safe. So. <laughs> Yes, that's 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 the point, and um, of course, um, yeah, they, they of course they did. Mother Nature didn't come up with the idea of, of drones, so they can only kill. So. <laughs> yeah, um, but it's, it's an it's an inter- interesting topic, and the, the data is, is a huge area that we are interested in, um, which is quite bitty in terms of the forest. But we can be only able to observe data in some sub areas of this big area, but we still want to understand how many or- orangutans are there in total in the in the whole area. So we need some kind of fancy statistical methodology to model that. But it's it's quite cool to d- directly be involved in the um, co- conservation of orangutans. It is. That's very interesting. Have you been in touch with the sanctuary? Um, well, not not myself, but they. Um, I think the researchers involved on um, the PhD student is, is very very engaged. With, um, he's been, you know, they, oh, everybody there in Malaysia and he's been visiting and, and so on. I don't think, don't even know all the details. I mean, he, as I said, he's not my PhD student, so I didn't really. Um, it start off the project. It's, I think it's actually it's even his his project in a way. I don't think his PhD supervisor initiated it, uh, but you know, it might not be true. So <laughs> that's very yeah. true because that's actually the area that my family are from. So East ah. Malaysia, yeah. <laughs> okay, didn't realize. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> ah, no, no, no need to apologize. <laughs> it was just an interesting <laughs> point. If you like, oh, like, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been to Malaysia. But only to KL, not um, not to Sabah, so I've um, not seen the area. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not from Sabah, I'm from Sarawak, so it's just a neighbouring state. Yeah, yeah, that's all, oh, wow, yeah. That's, I mean, and it's exciting to, to be directly involved with that, but it's, yeah, I would have, would like to visit maybe at some point and find funding and to justify that, that the statistician has to visit as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, you need to see the environment that you're actually working on to be able to get the correct context. <laughs> You know, as I was saying with the Australian data, that was the case. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it only is going to inform your work. Okay, uh, so um, might move on to some of those extra questions I did mention to you. Uh, so hmm. what hobby or interest do you have that is most unrelated to your work? Lots of <laughs> but so um, yeah, I think um it's difficult to say in a way because I often think almost everything is related to everything, but um, I know sometimes <laughs> but, um, it's difficult know, I, in that way. Yeah, no, it's a bit, um, I'm well, I, I, I really enjoy music, so I play the violin and um, I sing usually sing in a choir. Um, so that's probably not very sciencey. Um, I'm also very interested in kind of theater and literature. Um, linguistics as well so languages in general um so that's again not very science sciencey but um, i think i have a general interest in in the arts, the arts. and yeah and science things as well very very much so, so that's um yeah that's probably i think getting back to my early answer to one of your first very first questions so when i first started studying psychology i found this was kind of you know going across you know sociology psychology science and everything a little bit um, and I also studied um, English later on so you know it's I never I could never really decide what my main passion um, would be that's probably why I'm an interdisciplinary um, inter- interdisciplinary um, researcher rather than uh, you know well that makes sense yeah. yeah well it lets you have a bit of taste of everything and that's great yeah. did you ever consider returning to psychology at any point I think I would be interested in, in you know, if there was a if there was a topic um, that I, I could work on that involves psychology, I would find this interesting. Um, but not as a primary field. No, not not as a primary field as, as such. It's just you know not not uninteresting, but I've, I've somehow kind of moved away from it. Not not in a conscious way. Not saying I don't want to do psychology anymore, but um, yeah, it's just evolved um, in a way. I mean, I think my I I do have an interest in in you know, the communication of, of um, statistics to people and their understanding how you can how you can communicate um, uncertainty to people and how they understand these things and that you know there's a psychological aspect in that um, that I find interesting so you know I could see myself collaborating with somebody on, on that topic which, which involves psychologists um, and psych- 
technological um, work, but not as my main um, focus. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Have you found that um, that background has um, helped you in your current work? Yeah, I think um, in in then I mean on, on one hand of course that this, uh, my statistics came from the like statistical curiosity curiosity came from this, but it's also um, a lot of kind of thinking in terms of say in, in ecology you have there are a lot of kind of theories how something works and how an ecosystem works in in a way, and that's not unrelated in uh, to like um, the thinking that psychology has how people learn or how people think um, because you know there's a physical aspect to that and physical research to that but also kind of theoretical research in terms of yeah how is this actually all working together um, for example I'm trying to understand how a biodiverse community actually can exist or how the species coexist there are lots of theories about this um, that ecologists like to test and that's very similar in psychology so I think that kind of thinking something I was familiar with, even though it's, it's different theories. Um, and I think kind of philosophically or, in, you know, they are similar. The foundations are similar, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that probably has, has helped me. Like, uh, it's, it's a science that is less wet lap oriented. And then, you know, it's a similarly, oh, that's probably not the way to say it, but it's, it's, it's a science that has a lot of uncertainty in it and complexity in it. And, and ecology has that as well. That's probably complexity angle is probably the, the most re- relevant similarity that I found. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Cool. And okay. And which childhood book holds the strongest memories for you? Hmm. That's a difficult question. I'm not sure I have a good answer to this. I, I, I did a lot of reading and I still do. So I like quite a lot of books. So it's difficult to, to find, find one a single... particular one. Especially with regard to memories, that's that's puzzling me. <laughs> so, but like, when I, I say, um, like my favorite book it, um, of my childhood was always um, a book by Astrid Lindgren, who also wrote Pippi Longstocking. Um, oh, yes. I, I read kids, kids' books in, in German, um, and not all of them would have been translated into English. So, it's um, the book is called my favorite one is called Me or uh, My Me or something. I don't even know whether there's an English translation. So, that's my title um but yeah. it's just me or something. so it's, it's really me or my me or which it's, in german is me or my me or in, in, in swedish is something me or me me or something so um, but um yeah that's always been my favorite book i don't know it, it, it has this it's it's a somewhere between yeah it has a kind of fairy taleish angle it is quite it has a it's still a realistic and sad angle and it's still poetic as well I think these are the kind of elements in there that I I like and I still like like to this day I've read the book at least 20 times I think (laughs) (laughs) I know (laughs) oh wow that's a favorite well I have an interest in languages so at some point um I spent quite a lot of time in Denmark during my PhD so I picked up Danish and one of the first books I tried to read which was my favorite childhood book (laughs) yeah of course yeah because you you yeah, you're familiar with the story, so you can kind of work the language through it, as, and you know how it's supposed to flow. Yeah, yeah, and of course it's it's easier than a, a you know a, a book for a, 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 <laughs> adults. An adult. Yeah, even though it's I mean it's a proper book, it's it's got you know text and it. it's not just a picture as well. You know. <laughs> but yeah, it, simpler like simpler language, simpler concepts to be able to understand when you're using it for language learning. That's a good idea. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's great. And lastly, what advice would you give someone who wants to do what you do and what advice should they ignore? The advice I would give is, is definitely um, follow your own interest, in, interests. Don't um, really just listen to people. Like, don't copy somebody else's interests. You know, Try to find your interest and your thing. Um, and as I've said a few times, I'm, I'm very kind of interdisciplinary when I first started I was kind of very I always felt I was the weird person who did applied statistics because <laughs> the area I work in spatial modeling um, or the specific spatial modeling I'm doing is fairly theoretical or the literature used to be extremely theoretical so I always felt 
with oh yeah, I'm 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 not doing the the, the tough theory theory here. I, you know, why would somebody be interested in what I'm doing? And nowadays, I have the confidence to just say, well, you know, this is me. This is what I'm doing, and and people are actually really interested in that. Um, you know, otherwise, be here, I think. And um, but. It, it took me a while to kind of have the courage to just say, well, that's what I, I am doing. And, you know, so my advice would be to to just say, you know, if you think that's what you want to do and then just, you know, follow that um, and, and don't necessarily kind of follow what others have been doing. Take their advice, but don't just copy them because that doesn't work. You can't copy somebody else, um, you know, see what they do, what you like about them or what they are. They, they have abilities, but don't don't change yourself on your own own interests. That's probably my statement. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, that's interesting. I would never have thought that as a like because I'm not in the field. Just just mm. listening to you describe your work just doesn't sound weird to me. It it's just an interesting other area of research. Like it. Yeah, yeah I think it's um a lot of the methodology that I'm, I'm using was um developed in in a very theoretical concept more as part of you know, geometry statistical stochastic stochastic geometry where people try to describe in a very abstract way coming up with in a, in a mathematical way of describing geometrical structures um or, or topological structures and 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 so on and that's it's a, it's, that's a very theoretical tradition that's purely really kind of very mathematical um, and that's exciting and interesting and tough, and, and you know I, I appreciate that work very much. But it wasn't really for me to just work in this theoretical context. I, I've always wanted to um, kind of say, well, you know, here's a data set, and I want to find an answer, a scientific answer that it's this data set something a bit more tangible in results. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and and the kind of more statistical or mathematical world word would say, well, I want to kind of recreate that same pattern. I want to just understand. And not really understand why the pattern is there, but just be able to kind of say, well, these I want to, um, I want to capture the pro the geometrical pro properties of this. But what I want to do is is understand why it has this, these properties. Um, and but initially I kind of thought, oh yeah, but my stuff is just an application of the methods that they have developed. Um, but that's not true. You know, it's it's more it's been much more than that. It's it's you know, really understanding what the science wants and what the scientific question is and what scientific questions you can answer with it, and so on. So there's a, there's a whole um, range of of complexities there that initially I didn't see it, and of course I was young and inexperienced. So, <laughs> Yeah, young and you, innocent you, <laughs> you don't have the um, confidence to just say yeah i'm doing this now that you know and but over the years i kind of thought you know this is exactly what, what, what i should tell people that you know if you do something differently that's that might be actually exa exactly the thing that will be useful because nobody else is doing it yet um yeah and like even a lot of the other people i've spoken to as well what they what they do now didn't exist before or was just in its early stages of development for that area. So you don't know where a path might like what where a path might lead you. And yeah. It, it's yeah. What you what you do sounds fascinating to me. Like I I don't really see a problem with this. <laughs> Nowadays I don't either, but you know, so maybe yeah. I'm only slightly more convincing than I was twenty years ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, you can you can see like being able to see a product of your work, even if it's just in terms of charts and statistics. Like being able to actually see a tangible result is amazing. Like you, you've made this, you've been able to um, analyze it and digest it and come up with all of these interesting answers from what you've gathered, and that's that's great. That's that's fascinating. <laughs> As I also not also think that you know when I look looking back I was like yeah if I had known like you know when I first started with my PhD um, twenty years ago I, I had I had I known this I would have thought wow no, no never <laughs> <You know>? never <laughs> so I, I remember in the early days kind of thinking oh, yeah maybe at some point I'm going to talk about this at a conference wow <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> lofty <know>? goals <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just at the time like yeah, maybe you know? Yeah. Thank you. No, that really is very cool. Like, all of it is very cool. And just the scope of the work that 
you're able to work with, the range of other researchers and collaborators that you have, like that's just being able to have access to so many different fields and learn so much more. That's awesome. Yeah, that's what I enjoy, yeah. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Okay, well, thank you so much for your time today, Janine. It's been brilliant just learning everything that you've been working on and all the scope of all the cool work that you can do. Um, <laughs> if people would like to reach out to you to learn a bit more about your work, uh, how can they do that? I think the easiest would be to send me an email um, on my Glasgow email address. Um, yep. Yeah, so I we think can, that's the yeah. easiest. So I'll just put up the Glasgow profile up on the website. And mm -hmm. yeah, that'd be cool. Great. Thank yeah. you so much for your time. This has been brilliant. And been yeah, I yeah, really appreciate this. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much and have a great day. Yeah, you as well. Oh, night. <laughs> <laughs> yes, night. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thanks. Statistical analysis and spatial point modeling has so many applications across a diverse range of fields, and it allows us to gain a better understanding of everything from criminal activities and disease behaviours through to geological events. And with such a broad scope, it's unsurprising that there is so much potential for interdisciplinary collaboration, especially if, as Janine said, you can keep an open mind. To learn more about Janine and what we discuss on this show, or to connect with us, please visit the Steampard website at steampardshow.com. You can also reach out to Janine through her university profile, the links for which will be in the show notes. If you enjoyed this conversation, please let me know. Subscribe to this channel, leave a comment below, and share this with your geeky or geek curious friends. You can also support Steampowered on Patreon and Ko-fi under Steampowered Show, the links for which will also be in the show notes. Thanks for watching.